Assalamualaikum everyone and good afternoon. So today, once again, uh, we have a uh, monthly uh, departmental uh, seminar. Uh, so today we are fortunate to have somebody uh, from outside EPM, uh, Dr. Norhas Niza Yusuf. Uh, she's a senior lecturer at Department of Physics and New Stimulaya. And uh, just a bit of background, uh, she did a PhD uh, in 2012 uh, under the SPIT uh, program between uh, University of Malaya and Kiel University, right? Yes, correct. And, and uh, under the Commonwealth uh, Scholarship. Uh, I've known, uh, I've known uh, Dr. Noah Saliza from some no, quite a long time ago when she was still a student, I think. Yes, correct. <laughs> and uh, she has a research interest in uh, stellar physics, uh, focusing in massive stars and uh, also neutrino physics. Uh, uh, I think I'll hand it over to you now so we can start. Okay, okay. All right. Oh, thank you, Dr. Shemudin. So, hold on, uh, I'm going to have two screen because of when I start my uh, presentation, I cannot see if there is any question or something like that. So I hope everyone don't mind if I do this. <laughs> okay, sure. All right. So uh, thank you, Dr. Shemudin, for a very nice introduction. And thank you for inviting me to give talk uh, today. Uh, I think this is my second time giving talk to... Uh, UPM. I think the last one, the first one is uh, when I was a, student, a PhD student, probably like 10 years ago, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but uh, the topic is a bit uh, different from the one that I've given today. <laughs> and um, today I'm going to uh, focus a bit about what is our current work. So uh, hello everyone. So I hope that uh, you will enjoy this talk and uh, feel free to interrupt and ask whatever things that uh, you want to, to know about uh, our work or our project. So this uh, work is being carried out for the past like more than five years uh, and it was done together with our uh, two PhD students, uh, Doran and also Nur Sophia. And uh, we have uh, published this uh, work early this year after being uh, testing, doing a lot of uh, what we call it calculation to see that either our idea is can be implemented in the stellar evolution. Okay, so uh, our focus is we are going to study what is neutral, uh, neutral emission from very massive star in the local universe. Why we focus in local universe? Because this is the one that near to us and it can be observed, right? And uh, for, for the last uh, decade, I think like more than uh, 60 years, uh, people have worked in neutrinos, but more focus on the solar neutrino. Okay? So uh, the neutrino for uh, stellar neutrino from uh, massive star or very massive star or supernova has been recently um, been in interest of the uh, scientific community when uh, people start to detect neutrino from supernova type 1A. So here I show you uh, some uh, figure, which I'm going to <coughs> explain a bit later on about how we map the thermal process in um, stellar evolution uh, into the uh, temperature density profile for the mass range that we want to study. Okay. So the outline of uh, my talk today is I'm going to give a bit introduction about a neutrino and stellar evolution. Uh, so this talk will be like uh, some uh, bridging between you know what you know what, you need to know about um, particle physics, astroparticle physics, which is a neutrino, and also how we're going to uh, complement this in the stellar evolution. This is the astrophysics part. So uh, this field is require some knowledge, uh, both in particle physics and also in astrophysics. Okay? So, and uh, when I introduce these uh, two parts, I'm, I'm trying to avoid uh, dealing with a lot of equation. I'm going to explain what are the physics behind this thing. And after that, I'm going to give some brief literature review. What uh, password have you done in stellar neutrinos? Okay, so it was uh, gaining some interest back in early 2000 when people start to uh, study 
the uh, what we call it the importance of stellar neutrino flux, especially when the new generation of a neutrino detector being built, right? And then I'm going to explain why we choose VMS. VMS stands for very massive star, uh, where the star is uh, greater than 100 solar mass. In this case, that uh, is actually a continuation from the previous work I've done for my PhD. I study about very massive star, the evolution, uh, but that is purely based on the astrophysics. And this work, we are going to combine a bit the uh, importance of the neutrino physics uh, for this particular type of star. And after that, we are going to see that you know, the different production of uh, production of neutrinos eh, in normal massive star and also for very massive star. We'll see that <coughs> due to the difference in the lifetime itself and also how it evolves uh, throughout its life, the process itself will be a bit different. And then we are going to discuss a bit of future work, which is our um, the uh, what called ongoing work that we are still working on, and we'll see that what are the <coughs> the new or the challenges that uh, being uh, that we need to address when we want to study this topic. <coughs> okay, so first of all, what is neutrino? What is a neutrino? So it's actually is an elementary particle in a standard model. So here we see that <coughs> the what they call it the picture or some nice diagram of the standard model where neutrino actually is belong to the lepton family. Okay, so uh, when we speak about neutrino uh, in uh, what we install, for example, the, uh, the neutrino that produced uh, in the process, first it was an uh, electron neutrino. And then this uh, muon and tau is uh, the flavor of neutrino that can be produced by to, uh, some flavor changing process. But that is will require more uh, physical understanding for you to see that how this a change of flavor can uh, a change from one flavor to another flavor depending on the condition, right? So, and uh, this neutrino is first predicted by Pauli back in 1931 when he observed the observation of radioactive decay, where when they observe the decay and they find that there is some missing energy uh, in the decay and they suspect what are the particles that carry this, uh, what they call it energy, and this is carried by actually a by the neutrinos, okay? So uh, neutrinos, technically, it is uh, it's similar like electron, but it is neutrally charged. So since neutrinos are neutrally charged, so it's uh, totally chargeless, uh, it, it is not easy to detect by using a, a common detector, okay? And one thing about neutrinos is because it's uh, neutrally charged, it only affects by a weak side atomic force, meaning that <laughs> it's able to pass through in any matter. For example, if neutrino produced in the sun, it can pass through uh, from the internal structure of the sun, it can pass to us uh, without um, any, uh, what they call it, stopping material. Okay, so this is one thing that were important for us to study neutrino, and it carries some significant energy during this process. And uh, one thing, uh, the, the important characteristic of neutrino is it is considered as massless in general. So whenever we do calculation in neutrino, for example, uh, the general one, we uh, assume that the m mu is uh, m mu is zero, but <laughs> due to oscillation, there is a small mass. There is mass in neutrino, but it's just around 10 power minus 37 kg. Comparable to electron mass is 10 power minus 18. You can see that how small it is, even though compared to the electron mass. That's so. Uh, that's why it is. Um, well, we call it. Uh, it is very difficult for us. To, uh, to see what is actually the mass and how to detect it. So to detect a very small uh, particle, we require a very huge detector uh, so that we know that what is uh, the need to know that hit to our detector. Uh, <clears throat> before I move further on, just to uh, explain to audience here, uh, I am a theoretical physicist, so I don't do experiment, <laughs> okay? So all experiment is being done by experimenters, but we, what we do is we predict what is uh, the what they call it, uh, the production of neutrinos in uh, the star, and we see that how it can be constrained uh, to our uh, to the detection that the experimenters have been set up. Okay, so that is one thing you have to bear in mind. Right, so I've shown you some um, picture of the neutrino detectors that uh, being uh, what they call it, used to detect neutrinos. 
One is Super Kamikande Experiment uh, in Japan. Super Kamikande Experiment uh, has uh, won several, I think, uh, Nobel Prize award to detect neutrino. I think one of the famous one is the solar neutrino flux. Okay, so and Super Kamikande uh, evolved from the simple Super, super Kamikande Experiment until now they have what we call as a hyper uh, Kamikande which uh, the sensitivity of how to detect neutrino has been increased. Because why? Now uh, our idea is neutrino is no longer uh, only being detected by the sun, but it can be detected, for example, supernova or uh, massive star that produce a lot of neutrino during the uh, evolution. And another experiment that being uh, famously built is the ice cube experiment. This is at the uh, Antarctica where they try to detect the neutrino from atmosphere that come to Earth because of Antarctica, they don't have any what they call it uh, many things that can uh, what they call it and can reduce some background uh, error and so on. So from there, they can uh, detect from Antarctica. <coughs> it will uh, go through at the center of the Earth, and then it will detect what is the neutrino being detected from the atmosphere. Okay, so this is one two example. Actually, we have a lot of neutrino detectors. Uh, the running one is currently is uh, Juno in China, German uh, underground neutrino. That is uh, one of the biggest neutrino detector that going is going to what they call it uh, finish. I think end of next year or this year. Okay, so uh, another one is the famous one is the uh, Sabri uh, neutrino in Canada, and then we have uh, several also in the Fermi lab. Okay, so this is uh, the neutrino detector that being used. And they, what they do is all the result from this uh, lot of detectors, they're going to merge and find the consensus between this uh, result. Okay, so next one. Uh, the focus of uh, this talk is I'm going to talk about the relationship between neutrinos and the star. Okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, <clears throat> the main uh, the research for a very long time is uh, we focus on the uh, people focus on the sun solar neutrino okay so sun which is our our sun produced the strongest uh, neutrino flux via nuclear fusion because why the sun itself being generated by the nuclear energy the fusion process so when it's a fuse so during the fusion process there will always be a neutrino being produced uh, what they call it uh, many times and these neutrinos can escape from the center of the sun and it come to the earth and can be detected by the, for example, the Supreme Candy experiment. And this uh, neutrino flux has been measured for decades. It even won the Nobel Prize yeah, for, for this uh, kind of work. So what people do now, although uh, people say that the uh, solar, uh, solar neutrino flux is a bit a long or an old research, but until today, uh, people aggressively still want to uh, measure what is the solar neutrino flux due to uh, several factors. One of the factors is the importance in the neutron oscillation because when neutrino oscillate, it proves that the neutron has a mass okay, through the neutrino oscillation. And another key of a still ongoing problem that people have no idea what is the solution is uh, the lithium problem abundance. Okay? So what happened is the lithium that produced in the sun is uh, what they call it too small, right? So, and compared with the uh, people calculate from the, uh, I mean, the theoretical calculation and observation, they have a huge gap. So people say that where is this neutrino, uh, sorry, oops, excuse me, my cat is coming. Okay, so people will try to uh, understand or explain where is this uh, remaining of the lithium problem? Uh, what they call it, where is it going to miss? It might be carried out by the neutrino flux, but still people are ongoing, try to solve this idea. Okay, so the second part is the one that we, we are focusing now is uh, for massive star. So the picture here is actually the very massive star observed uh, back in 2010 in one of our paper where we try to see that what is the mass of uh, the most uh, massive star that can be detected in our local universe. Okay? So the massive star itself, uh, the, what they call it, um, the important engine to make sure a massive star or very massive star uh, keep going 
or keep alive is through the neutrino cooling or neutrino loss. So neutrino uh, will act as a as a fridge, right? So it will uh, when we have a lot of uh, neutrino, sorry, a lot of uh, nuclear reaction produced in the center of the star. So uh, the neutrino uh, cooling will supersede this uh, what called nuclear uh, reaction to make sure the star stay cool. If, if uh, for why? Because if the star is too hot, it will what they call it collapse or it will um, what they call it destroy uh, faster. So neutrinos is important by keeping uh, the massive star alive for a certain time. Okay. So um, one thing is that in a massive star, they have what we call the nuclear fusion in massive star, we call it as a beta decay process. Uh, but because of the, uh, due to the temperature density of massive star, is larger than our sun, so that uh, the neutrino cooling will supersede the nuclear fusion at the advanced stages of the star. Later on, I will explain what is the advanced stages uh, <coughs> in the massive star. Another thing is when there is a bad reaction of this uh, in the nuclear process, it will provide some limit for the, uh, for example, in the neutrino magnetic moment. Okay, so this is more, uh, what they call it, you have to solve uh, in a more physics process instead of astrophysics. Okay, so the third one is the one that people are saying a lot currently, <coughs> and most of the neutron detector uh, try to cater for the third part. Okay, so where is, uh, when we have a supernova, when the star uh, towards end of the light, of, uh, end of its life going to die, it will die uh, before it die as a black hole or neutron star, it will experience what we call as a supernova explosion. And during this, uh, what they call it stage, supernova explosion, it produces massive uh, production of neutrino because the energy will be carried out through this process and will be dispersed throughout our universe. And one of the famous observation is uh, from the supernova type 1A, 1987A, Okay, so because this is being, uh, being detected <coughs> during this time, so from there, when uh, the neutrino detector suddenly observes some peak of neutrino flux when this uh, event occurs. Okay, so that is why people say that if, for example, oops, sorry. Hold on. Sorry, there is. I share back again my slide. Okay, so when uh, the what they call it observation of uh, supernova tap eight one seven uh, explode, there will be a high number of neutrino flux being detected from the uh, neutrino detector. Okay, so that's why um, people might say if beta juice the one of the massive star explode, uh, one of the key uh, people will observe that there is a neutrino flux will increase rapidly uh, through the neutrino detector. We can observe that because why? During that time, uh, <coughs> comparable with the supernova type 1A, 1987, is a thermonuclear uh, supernova, which is a smaller mass, the progenitor, but beta juice is a more massive star. So we uh, could not only we can uh, see the light curve or the luminosity of the supernova itself, but we can also observe the neutrino flux that being, uh, <coughs> being produced during this, uh, what they call it, um, explosion. And this is also uh, provide some well-established particle physics constraint where at a certain, uh, what they call it, angle or a certain mass, or sorry, not so energy, we know that that is where uh, the, the particle or the explosion happened during that time. Okay, so that is uh, the relationship between this, uh, what they call it, a different type of star. Okay, so uh, I move on into the process of uh, the nuclear reaction itself. Okay, so for the uh, low mass star, for example, sun, okay, so we only have uh, two type of burning stage. First, we have hydrogen burning where the proton-proton uh, uh, is going to fuse to produce deuteron and also helium uh, and carbon. Yeah? So, and this process is, although the process for the solar light star, like our sun, they have only two process, but the lifetime is longer. It needs to have around 8 billion years to transform fully hydrogen into 
killing process. But for Mesister, we have several uh, burning stage. Burning stage means that this is the process that from uh, hydrogen, it fuses, produce helium. Okay, so the helium, it will uh, fuse again with all the elements that you have to produce carbon, and then it will move until it produces what we call as a silicon core. So from carbon, oxygen, neon to silicon, this is what we call at one burning stages. Why this process happen? Because of mass star have a, a higher temperature density. So the nuclear reaction uh, that occur in the internal, uh, what they call it, star itself, is going to be uh, much longer and more complicated. And it will take, <coughs> what they call it, the lifetime. Oops, sorry, not 10 billion years. I'm going to change a bit. It's around, <coughs> approximately around 5 billion years, OK? So this is because the lifetime of massive star is shorter. Okay? So uh, what happened in <coughs> star uh, is uh, a bit uh, how we can put in a simple manner. When the star is larger or more massive, the lifetime or the age of the star becomes shorter. So you can see that for, uh, and then we move to the very massive star here. A very massive star due to the, what they call it, is too massive. At one point at the carbon burning stage, it cannot hold the structure anymore. When it cannot hold the structure anymore, it will explode. And all this remnant will produce, uh, contribute to the molecular cloud uh, at the surrounding. And the lifetime for very massive star, this is, uh, I forgot to mention it. So this is around one solar mass. Massive star is greater than eight solar mass. And for very massive star is 100 solar mass. Okay, so 100 solar mass and above, the lifetime is around two or three million years. It's very short lifetime. So when we able to observe it, and it means that uh, within <coughs> two or three million years, it will eventually explode as a specific type of supernova. <coughs> okay, so we see that the neutrinos from the star, where it's come from. Okay, so the neutrinos, uh, one is coming from the nuclear process, the nuclear fusion process, this is for the low mass star, and another one is thermal process. Okay, so the thermal process is the process uh, that uh, occur for only for very massive star. Hold on here. Yeah. Okay, so for the solar neutrino, so solar neutrino is mainly coming from the uh, <clears throat> the nuclear reaction. Okay, so when we uh, see that the nuclear reaction a process, we have several parts, and you can see that there are although we have change of reaction in the sun, for example, but not all process produce neutrinos. Okay, so when they have uh, several process that produce neutrinos. And from there, we can observe what are the solar neutrino flux. This is coming from the, what they call it, um, calculation of the solar neutrino flux. And this will become the constraint when people want to observe at the neutron detector. Okay, so coming back to our work, uh, in a massive star or very massive star, there are several process that we have to uh, take account when we want to study the neutrino cooling. Okay, so one is what we call as a pair annihilation, where we have some electron uh, positron that uh, annihilate to produce some neutrino and antineutrino. <laughs> and we have a, a photoneutrino process because of uh, the photon, um, what they call produce uh, a lot in a massive star. So it will interact with either electron or positron and it will produce some, um, what they call it, electron plus with the uh, neutrino and antineutrino. So we have to consider both. And again, since uh, this, the star itself is uh, made by plasma, ionic gas, right? So it's, it's a plasma. So we have to consider the plasma decay. So plasma decay means that uh, the plasma will decay to become a, a, the, this pair of a neutrinos. <clears throat> Another process that um, nowadays people are going to look at is brain strahlum process, where we have some electron neutrino interact with uh, another atomic, what they call it, a nuclei in the star itself, and it will produce back the, the pair of uh, neutron and antineutrino plus the electron. And you can see that because of this uh, process, it will eventually depend on temperature density uh, for this particular process. And finally, we have 
recombination process. Recombination process meaning that, for example, if the star reach to become a neutron star or a white dwarf, this is we have to consider is it in uh, what called liquid state or in a, what they call it uh, some special ionic state. So this is all the type of the star, uh, sorry, type of the process that we have to consider when we want to study uh, massive star. This is due to the uh, the evolution of the time uh, and also the temperature density profile during its lifetime and it will change uh, the behavior of the process. And this has been uh, compiled by, oops, excuse me. I'm not sure why it stopped. Forgive me for the interruption. Hold on. Okay, so all this work is uh, being uh, what do you call it compiled, first suggested by Foyle and Hall uh, back in 1964. And uh, the how to derive all this process has been done by Budet Petrosian and also Dickers. Eh? So this uh, all this process must be solved by using the uh, Weinsberg Salam theory to solve all these things. It's not just that we know the process and we know there is uh, we have to deal with the physics behind it before we can we came to the come to the conclusion of all this process and uh, after that ito uh, in his compilation in 1989 and also 1996 he compiled all this process that people have done independently in one paper where it can be implemented in the stellar evolution process although this uh, the compilation done by ito is actually very crude yeah? so when we want to use it we have to consider what is the constraint and also the limit that we should be implement for all this process. Okay, so this is the original idea. This is the one that done by using the Weinberg Salam theory, first being done by uh, Dickers back in uh, 72. Okay, uh, the first one is actually Buda. Buda is uh, given the idea how to calculate the neutron energy loss using the pair production photo and plasma. This is only three during this time. Okay, so after that, uh, Dickers um, produced in 90. Uh, 72 paper and he calculate by using the Weinberg theory of EM and uh, weak interaction to fill in the gap for what are the three things that we have to understand in calculating the, uh, the neutrino in the, uh, in the stellar region. Okay, so some uh, brief, uh, what they call it, uh, overview that what people have done before, where uh, this is back in 1965. Yeah? So when uh, this idea is not really being, what we call it, accepted widely. Okay. So uh, Masevich in 1965 published in the Soviet Union Astronomy, uh, he proposed that uh, what is the neutron luminosity for uh, 0 0.8 solar mass star until 200. This is mean that from lower than uh, sun up to the very massive star. And what are the physical process that produce the neutrino? And here he proposed mainly from the pair production due to the uh, uh, density and temperature that can uh, be implemented for this process. And uh, this one is being done, uh, I think, by theoretical calculation, medically, and then they estimate what is the energy liberation uh, and how much we should expect for the sun to keep going before it can uh, explode as a supernova. Okay? And <clears throat> after quite a long gap of study of the neutrino, back 2004, Rizolek and his colleague uh, proposed that uh, the possibility of study uh, to detect uh, the pair production and neutrinos from the star before collapse. Because why? Uh, like I mentioned before, the study of a neutrino is mostly focused for the sun due to the observation of neutrin uh, solar uh, neutrino problem. Okay, So people uh, start to study that. What happens if you have star that far more larger. Okay, so there must be a lot of neutrino. If the sun itself can produce a quite highly energetic neutrino, how about if we have more massive or more larger sun? So it possibly that they, we have more neutrinos without we know that uh, it produces uh, every second. Okay, so here we see that what is uh, uh, being presented 
what is the difference between the uh, the sun and also the here he choose 20 solar mass which is uh, the it falls under the category of mass star so he see that uh, what is uh, the lifetime of uh, the sun and also for this um, massive star you can see that for the sun for example the age is very long and for compared to massive star is around 300 years okay so this is uh, it only at the main sequence yeah? uh, main sequence means that during the hydrogen burning so you can see that uh, photon luminosity photon means that the one we observe uh, by using what they call it a uh, telescope here yeah? so we can observe the photon luminosity for sun is only one but for my sister around 10 power 5 means that it more luminous okay so how that um, if more luminous it means that they have a more what they call it uh, energy and from there we estimate that the energy that produced from the sun is around 10 for power 49 comparable to the my sister is 10 power 51 which is much much larger so it is a quite um, what they call important that we have to really to study and understand why this massive star uh, people don't really uh, aware of study but probably the one that we detect on earth is actually mixing between this uh, solar neutron plus the uh, from the massive star itself okay so what he did is he um, what they call it uh, superimposed this actually the uh, what they call it, the solid line is coming from uh, the solar neutrino flux calculated by Bacall back in 2005. Okay, so this is being uh, as a what we call strain for the observation, and then he calculated for 20 solar mass, and he find that it's quite have a significant contribution of the uh, neutrino flux in terms of energy uh, when we superimpose with the solar neutrino uh, from the sun. Okay, so this is uh, one of the main contribution why people start to study stellar neutrinos. Okay, so um, in 2009, Alexander Heger uh, pr proposed that when, uh, what happened if we test neutrino magnetic moment in the massive star? So he chose uh, three types of uh, massive star, 10, 50, and 25. Uh, this is the normal uh, evolution of a massive star. This is uh, with uh, temperature and density. And all this wiggle is actually the where the star start to contract and uh, burn new what they call fuel or new what they call it uh, reaction. Okay, so this is when you can see that when there is a wiggle here, it means that the star contract and expand. So that the energy when it's uh, contract and expand, it means that the energy density start to what they call it boost up and give uh, what they call it a new temperature so that the next nuclear reaction can occur. So he tested the neutrino magnetic moment <coughs> and what happened is now the uh, the track is being what they call it diverge a bit compared to the original one okay so and from here although the mass is a bit slightly different yeah so because i think he tested to see that what is the effect yeah? so uh, when he tested the effect of the magnetic moment you can see that the star become a bit uh, cooler compared to the this normal uh, evolution so this is due to the neutrino cooling so when a neutrino uh, cool down means that uh, it will, as uh, what you call it, try to expand the lifetime of the neutrino. Uh, sorry, the the star itself. Uh, one thing that we have to bear in mind when Alexander Higa test this uh, neutron magnetic moment, he only consider the direct neutrino. Okay, so neutrino do have uh, another what you call that we have a Majorana neutrino. Okay, so that is uh, if we combine these two, we might uh, see that more what they call it effect in the evolution of star itself okay <clears throat> so uh, next in 2015 some japanese group uh, kato uh, they have uh, proposed that we have to use this stellar neutrino flux okay and luminosity to distinguish different what they call it core when the star evolve because why different mass uh, of massive star they will produce different core. This core is where before it explodes as a supernova. Some of the star will uh, stop when it produces oxygen neon. O and E is not one, it's oxygen neon, oxygen neon core. And another one is the, the typical one is uh, ferrum core or the iron core. Okay, so if we have this uh, two type of uh, progenitor or the star that have this kind of core, 
we uh, we should use whatever that produced during the stellar uh, neutrino production and we can see that the difference between these two we can able to dis distinguish that what are the stage of that particular star okay and here it calculate the luminosity and also uh, he consider what is what we call it uh, the flavor so this is the uh, calculate first for the electron neutrino and the anti electron neutrino and after that he also consider what happened if we have some flavor changing process where where the neutrino can transform into muon or tau neutrino and also is anti neutrino pair so from here you can see that uh, here is the uh, eight solar mass okay, so eight, eight solar mass is around uh, 51 and you can see when you have higher mass uh, 15 uh, 12 and 15 the number of luminosity is getting higher due to the uh, the process itself or the temperature density itself will contribute into the uh, the stellar neutrino luminosity so uh, last but not least this is uh, the what they call done by uh, Kelly Patton. Okay, so Kelly is uh, he she tried to uh, to mimic the relativistic uh, from the stellar evolution. What she did is she tried to improve all the what they call the process that I've shown you earlier, and try to do some Monte Carlo simulation and see that exactly just before the star explodes as supernova, what is the behavior of the thermal process. Okay, so you can see that this is, uh, he put some several color. It means that this is uh, presented by pan neutrino. Uh, for the red one is uh, plasma neutrino. And uh, the dotted one is plasma. And blue one is coming from beta decay, the nuclear reaction. Okay, so he's, uh, what she tried to see that when uh, the time moving closer to the supernova, this is particular at certain time step. And he's, uh, she observed that uh, how that uh, the changing of the process will evolve eventually when we have uh, what we call different time, temperature, density, and also some uh, what they call it uh, electron, uh, what they call it uh, density. So from there, uh, all this component is, uh, they need to know um, what they call it flux or emission itself is very sensitive for this one and it will evolve eventually when the star start to uh, what you call it regular regularly uh, try to um, to collapse to become a supernova okay so now i'm going to introduce about the current work i have around 15 minutes more okay so uh, the current work is uh, this is uh, the fate of the star being uh, pre prepared by Alexander Hegel again so here he mentioned that if we have the range of uh, mass of the star. This is a uh, range of mass eh? and this is metallicity. So what happened to the star when it ends? So here, uh, the one that we are interested in is a region around 150 to uh, 500 solar mass. Okay, So the star it either will die as a pair instability supernova. This is pair supernova. We're going to end as either collapse directly to black hole, depending on the metallicity. Here, metallicity means that the component of the uh, heavy elements that, uh, what you call it, already inside of the star, when it's uh, start at the birth. Okay? So this is how they define. And from here, since this is continuation with my uh, former work, so we have studied the evolution of very massive star. And we see that uh, when the star have, uh, this is meaning that or this normal evolution, this is for solar metallicity. Solar metallicity means that the metallicity is similar to our sun. And what happens if we have a uh, star that metallicity is lower than our sun? It means that uh, what they call it is uh, a bit uh, older than our current uh, sun. And what happens is it will enter what we call as an instability region, this gamma 4 over 3. Okay, so this instability region where the star going to collapse without leaving any remnants, meaning that the star um, is explode all those, it will collapse the structure, and then it won't produce black hole, it won't produce uh, white drop, it won't produce neutron star. It's just uh, disperse all those elements throughout the, uh, what they call it, our galaxy. Okay, so we calculate the mass range of uh, what is the prediction. So this is the one that 
uh, people observe back in 2007. I think that I also give this talk, I think in UPM 10 years ago, I think. So here, the pay is stable supernova is, this is mass of carbon oxygen core. This is not the initial mass. The initial mass is uh, somewhere here. So we uh, observe that between 100 to 500 solar mass at certain mass metallicity, this uh, three model plus one here, it is eventually will explode as this type of supernova without any remnants. Without any remnants, so it must be some energy, energy, energy being uh, produced during this process. This is why we want to study how much neutrino being carried out at this point. But we are going to study not during the supernova, but before that. Okay, so some, uh, well, maybe I can skip this one. This is just the lifetime of the, uh, <clears throat> the star, how it evolved from the protostar until towards the end. Okay, so here, what happened now, I'm taking back the example that produced by Higa for without the neutron magnetic moment. So we can see that here, the wiggle of the star is stronger in a uh, massive star. But for very massive star, the wiggle is a bit weaker, but it's uh, still try to evolve until up to oxygen burning. Compared to the normal mass star, it will produce iron core. But for our model, it will only produce oxygen core or a bit of um, carbon, eh? carbon oxygen core. This is the limit where we have to estimate it going to explode as this uh, pair instability supernova. Pair instability supernova meaning that the star at this uh, the oxygen stage, uh, oxygen burning stage, the E plus E minus, and hydration is very strong, it will collapse the, uh, the structure of the star due to the uh, equation of state. Okay, so this is one thing that uh, a bit unique compared to the normal star. So what uh, we do is we try to map. So this is, uh, we hypothesis first. Yeah? So we hypothesis, uh, uh, hypothesis that how this, uh, com uh, all this process, we try to map in the temperature density, um, what they call it, uh, mapping, and we'll see that uh, this is the, our evolution track. What are the uh, situation or what are the uh, process that uh, will dominate for our evolution? So from here, we map that uh, photo and pair is the most dominant process uh, in this very massive star, but comparable done by Go and Ken. Go and Ken also use Alexander Higa, uh, what they call it, track. So he, observe that for the photo and also here, pair uh, is the most dominant. We'll see that, oh, it's, it looks the same, but this is just mapping. Eh? So we map through the, what they call it, a certain ratio of temperature and density, but we have to do the calculation itself in detail and what happened. So from here, we slice our star. So here is, uh, I slice 150 solar mass star to a, uh, the end of uh, before it uh, explodes, we slice up, okay, and we see that majority of the at the surface uh, there is no more hydrogen layer. It's purely helium. Plus we have uh, carbon and oxygen core. This is the the core that uh, what do you call it? Um, very dense core that eventually will collapse later on, and the silicon is very small. For normal core collapse supernova, normal supernova, silicon should be larger to collapse, to collapse all this element. Okay. So here we try to see that what happened when we have uh, several burning stage. Because why theoretically, or people have done calculation, uh, they say that the neutrino only produce when we start at advanced burning stage, meaning that when start carbon burning stage, the neutrino will start dominant. Before that, there is no neutrino. There is neutrino, but it is very low, not dominant. Okay. So, but in our calculation, we try to calculate back again uh, the uh, neutrino energy, and we find that even in the during the early stage of very massive star, there is neutrino start producing uh, quite a lot, and the energy is around ten power six uh, MeV per cube second. This is quite huge comparable to the normal star. And when we uh, evolve longer until it reach at the end of the 
what we call oxygen burning. Uh, what happened now, it will uh, start to, what they call it, have a uh, higher up this, uh, what they call it, the energy. So this is in MEV CM scale. So this, you will see that after this, what uh, the difference. So what happened now, we uh, observe that there is a, just now is a different, what they call it, uh, what they call it unit. Now we convert into the earth per second that comparable to the, what we call it, uh, with the neutrino detector. So we find that when we want to calculate all those things, <coughs> at, uh, at this point, the temperature density is already reached around 10 power 7 and 10 power 9k. This is very high compared to the normal mass star and it's also very dense. So when we have this uh, part, what happened is normally, uh, it was spare inhalation process will be dominant. This is being reported a lot in literature, but not in the case of our work. So in our work, the dominant is uh, more like a photoneutrino process here, the red one at the surface. Why is important at the surface? Because at this surface is where it will uh, run through to our, our earth. This is the one that we able to detect, right? So from here, what happened is we can see that the thermoneutrino is very sensitive to the temperature and density and a hot dense core, they gain a lot of neutral production. So uh, I haven't put something. So here, uh, what we can see that at the particular uh, value, when at the core of the, uh, of the star itself, where it's uh, very hot and dense, neutrino will be very energetic. But uh, when we start to have the, the changing of the temperature and density, it start to uh, change the process according to the uh, time, uh, sorry, the temp temperature and density uh, range uh, that should, uh, the condition for each process, okay? And one thing that we have to calculate when we calculate the energy, the energy is usually uh, we compare for the new <coughs> supernova neutrino observation. And another thing that uh, people have to measure is luminosity, okay? So when we have luminosity, we'll see that what is the trend of luminosity for individual mass, right? So you can see that here, this is mass of 150 up to 500, the one that we choose for our work, right? So when we uh, start to choose for different uh, star and uh, different mass of star and also malicity, we observe that uh, for, I forgot to mention, for 100 uh, until 300, the metallicity is um, a bit lower compared to the 500. This is uh, the star that produced during the second generation. Yeah. So and then the 500 is at the current generation. So uh, because of the early generation, the melts a bit less. So a bit less. It means that um, how they shred the layer of the star is a bit less. So it able to contain more helium and also carbon. Uh, what they call it layer, so that it will have more luminosity. Okay, so another thing that we have to consider that you, uh, because the star have its own lifetime, so there is a contribution of the mass loss towards the life. It means that when you get older, you become thinner. So this is one analogy that we can uh, describe for the, what they call it, uh, neutrino. Okay, so I already have my second last slide. Okay, so here our goal is, this is uh, this a bit different. This is the one that we are going to, uh, do for to compare with the one that people observe astronomically. So this is how people in astronomy uh, plot the luminosity compared to the age. Okay, so this is luminosity the the light that we can observe uh, through the telescope. Okay, and this is instead of using the normal photon, we try to uh, map using the uh, neutron luminosity and see that what is the difference. Obviously. The photon is around, what they call it, 10 power 7, right? So, and, but you can see that velocity is uh, a bit higher. It's 10 for 47, okay? So, but uh, neutrino, even though it's more luminous and more higher, it cannot be detected by, uh, by our eyes. It has to detect by the neutron detector. How much is it? So, this is one thing that we want to see that if there is stronger neutron luminosity, it means that all this, um, what they call it, the value or luminosity being detected, it might uh, give some constraint, whatever uh, people have detected using the supercamican, they 
or ice cube and so on, right? Okay, so future works. What's next? So uh, this is, I show you the old work that we have done uh, in 2012, where this is, uh, we map using the luminosity and effective temperature, similar to this one. But this is a larger grid from low mass star, one solar mass until we have longer one. And now we are doing some uh, new paper <coughs> in preparation. I'm not showing the, the new, uh, what do you call it, uh, result, where we are going to, uh, to uh, reproduce some, um, what do you call it, grid of the, this is for astrophysics first, uh, or the grid from one solar mass until 500 solar mass. We met for the photon first. Okay, so that is the first part of our work. We're going to replace this old uh, grid. And after that, we are going to reproduce some neutrino luminosity, uh, what we call as a neutrino HI diagram, neutrino Russell diagram. This is the normal HI diagram. Okay? So after that, uh, we are going to uh, study what is the neutrino spectrum and flux from the BMS. This is need to be done independently uh, after we calculate the luminosity itself. And after that, uh, we have to consider what are the neutrino oscillation uh, that could be effect in very massive stars. This is not many work has been done for this neutrino oscillation because people always focus neutrino oscillation only occur in sun. But how about in very massive star or massive star? There must be oscillation due to the more energetic uh, environment. And the consideration of magnetic moment, we are going to consider both the direct and myonara and see that how it will affect in the cooling of the, what they call it, uh, the star itself. Plus uh, this neutrino spectrum and flux uh, <coughs> varies, um, sorry, various process with different density. And why we are working very hard on this? Because uh, I think in a few more years, the new hypercomic can be able to detect as far as 100 kiloparsec where our model that we, I just showed it to you, the one that we predict for the phase supernova, the location of the star is around 50 kiloparsec. So that's why we see that is we can contribute in the constraint for the observation of the uh, <coughs> stellar uh, neutrino flux. Okay, thank you everyone. Question? I hope okay. I'm on time. <laughs> the teacher will uh, still have a uh, amount of time uh, for Q&A. So, uh... Thank you, Dr. Nas Niza. Uh, that was an interesting talk, but you know, not being uh, uh, well versed uh, in uh, nuclear astrophysics. There are you know, many questions in my head. Uh, but, yeah, uh, no, no problem. I think, uh, I don't know whether about but time, but I'm still okay if you want to go beyond four o'clock for me. <laughs> okay. uh, so I, I welcome uh, questions from others first, uh, if there are any. <coughs> Yeah, everything everything is alien, alien to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm a, being I'm a, a magnetic man, so I'm quite interested to know that if you have a flux, flux, a neutron, a neutrino flux uh -huh. uh, around, let's say, the uh, uh, huge magnetic field uh, in, in in the space, what what happened? What kind of Interaction will. Oh, you mean for the neutrinos? So, yeah. uh, one thing of uh, the what they call magnetic field in neutrino, because of it was not uh, what they call it, it will, it's actually uh, it's a weak interaction. For normal uh, magnetic field, I don't think it will give any, any effect for this one. Mm -hmm. So, the other, the other thing is um, you keep mentioning the burning. We know mm -hmm. that when we burn, uh, burn anything, it goes into. Other form, other, yes, form, yes. other form. So what yes. is this doing this burning, hydrogen burning, helium burning, and so on? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I didn't say uh, the detail. Actually, this is coming from the principle of nuclear physics, yeah? uh, the idea of these burning stages. So what happened, let me show you. Okay, so when we speak about uh, this nuclear burn, uh, hydrogen burning, helium burning, uh, we have to uh, see that for a uh, sun or any star, the main element in the star is hydrogen or proton, right? So the proton mm. proton will fuse together, will fuse to produce uh, helium. So this uh, process of uh, uh, hydrogen fusion, this is called as uh, hydrogen burning. They burn hydrogen to produce ashes, which is 
helium. Okay, so when uh, we produce quite significant number of helium, so helium start to fuse with proton, with the helium itself, or whatever, whatever element to produce, uh, for example, carbon, neon, and so on. So this is what we call as a helium. It means that we burn the helium in the star to produce mm -hmm. the different uh, product. So after several uh, age or several times, the lifetime, so it will be a lot of carbon. So the so carbon- that, that, that burning requires, requires uh, fuel, requires energy you know, to, to burn anything. Yes, so okay. That comes so, from where? Oh, because uh, the star itself do have some gravitational contraction, right? So the first, uh, when we start, uh, for example, hydrogen to fuse, so the star will start to from the molecular cloud, right? So molecular cloud, the cloud that uh, form after what we call several years, the cloud will uh, contract due to the gra gravitational force. It will contract and expand, contract and expand until at a certain point, the temperature will reach at the limit for the nuclear fusion to occur. Because when we calculate the proton-proton change, we can, we can calculate the effective temperature, right? Effective temperature for the uh, reaction to occur. This is coming from the Maxwell-Boseman equation because this is just a plasma, it's a gas of plasma, right? So when we uh, have the environment of this perfect gas condition, we have certain temperature and we can see that what is the effective temperature for a proton-proton to fuse. So each time the, uh, the contraction happens, so the hydrogen fuse, fuse, and then the star will contract. Okay, so contract and expand, and after that, the, the temperature will uh, going up uh, at certain point, and after it's uh, being uh, contract, it will going down, and after that, uh, the uh, what called the nuclear process will change to to another process. This will continuously occur or happen until all the uh, fuel fuel. This is what we call fuel fuel. Uh, I did the protein everything uh, finish until there is no more what we call it, um, what we call nuclei can be burned. Because why? Uh, for example, iron. Iron is the most stable element. When we reach at a uh, stage of iron or nickel, for example, there is no more nuclear reaction occur. There will be different process happen. So, my last question is, okay. uh, uh, how, uh, how important is a neutrino in, uh, to our, our, our life on Earth? <laughs> okay, so, okay so uh what is the important uh neutrino eh? so one things of um neutrino detection eh? so for the solar neutrino one uh, the important things is we we can understand how long our sun will uh, stay alive that is one thing okay because why uh when uh people study the what you call the lifetime of the sun itself coming from the the need to know that we detect on Earth. Okay, so how much need to know can be produced? Because if we uh, observe that uh, certain what they call need to know might be less or more, we might uh, underestimate what is the lifetime of our sun, for example, because we, we, we don't know, right? So the one that we study now is actually purely being constrained by the observation. Okay, so uh, and also one thing that uh, people try to what they call it, understand for from the uh, what they call it massive star for the neutrinos yeah so we uh, will predict that for example like beta juice yeah beta juice the most brightest massive star that people observe now we are people are very curious what happened if it's explode people will uh, think that how much neutrino uh, will come to earth of course in in term of what they call it uh, human being it won't affect much on ourselves, but this is the understanding of uh, the physics or the new physics will come through when we study this kind of uh, work. I hope I, I answer your question. I think everything you say is correct. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> I <live. laughs> yeah, thank you. Right. Oh. There's a raised hand by Dr. Mustafa. Okay, Assalamualaikum, Dr. Nohariza and everyone. Okay, Thank you for a very nice talk today. <laughs> okay, uh, if you look back, the light travel at constant speed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But anything with with mass can travel at any speed. Okay. 
Okay, so why then do we only see neutrinos traveling at velocity consistent with the speed of light? Meaning that neutrinos, uh, what do you call it? You say traveling consistent with the speed of light? Yes, because I found several articles because I'm not from the, I also like from elementary science background. <laughs> so I found from some article they say that neutrinos always traveling at velocity consistent with the speed of light. I think all particles do that, right? Yeah, but why? Why? Mm -hmm. mm. Can anyone uh, answer that? <laughs> because I just want to just know. Because you just use know. Einstein's, Einstein's uh, equation. <laughs> Einstein's equation equal to mc square. So <laughs> although the neutrino is massless, right? So it's massless, it's always a travel, um, what they call within the speed of light due to the conservation of energy. So that is one thing that uh, we uh, what is the standard uh, things that we study in our first year uh, what called textbook, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in twenty twenty, they claim that neutrino a supersede than our light. Is it correct? Huh? You don't know what? Supersede in twenty twenty. I found from one article. If I know, uh, I think there is a movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> is it correct? Oh, well, the one that. Uh, uh, from the movie that they say that uh, if you uh, watch the I think 2000, 2000 or 2020 the, the movie by John uh, by John Cusack eh? so he mm. said that when the what they call it, the star I mean the sun uh, produces a lot of neutrino the the core of the the earth is uh, will be what they call it destroyed off or being uh, what they call it explode which is totally ridiculous it won't happen that way because <laughs> of the uh, neutrino is very weakly interacting uh, particles. So when you want to detect the neutrino itself, you need uh, what we call, for example, the scintillation and also the heavy water, for, for example, like argon, uh, to, to find the, what they call it, how they emit the, uh, the neutrino. And I think uh, the probability of the neutrino emission is very small. I think okay. 10 power, I don't remember. Prasi, you remember what is the probability of neutrino detection? Uh, uh, on Earth, mean. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the the current species is between uh, uh, 0.3 to 0.5. Means that for every 10 uh, neutrinos, they will detect three neutrinos up to five neutrinos. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, something like that. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, there were a few uh, raised hands, but um, maybe I want to interject a little bit from Dr. Mustafa's uh, question just now. I think. Okay. What what he meant was that the, there was an experiment that they did uh, in Europe, I think, where mm -hmm. they claimed much earlier it was supposed to be superluminal. I think that was wrong, right? Yeah, yeah it's wrong. I think it's coming from the Blaza neutrino, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Something like that. Because. Right, uh, mm -hmm. Okay, now, go ahead. Do you want to explain something? Okay, so uh, the now the neutrino, the one that uh, people might read from the article or whatever things. So the one that I explained here is uh, purely coming from the star. So there is also neutrino coming from, for example, uh, from the earliest, from the Big Bang. Yeah? So there is also the remnants of neutrino still traveling on Earth. Uh, people still uh, uncertain and also another things uh, people uh, try to study that um, one of the candidate of the dark matter, uh, dark matter uh, for the that occur in a, in our galaxy also might be one of the candidate of uh, is a neutrino, but still all these things are uncertain because um, also there is one idea people say that uh, if the star is not a black hole, is some Newtonian star for example, a Newtonian uh, dark star, probably the what you call energy generated by that particular neutrino star is coming from the dark matter, which is totally a neutrino. That is another idea people try to convince, uh, to accept. And because of the interaction occur, so there is a vast of energy traveling, but we cannot see how much is it or what is the mass of the star itself, something like that. That is uh, the idea people try to propose. Yeah, I think uh, I better let uh, Izzat uh, ask the questions. I think yeah, few. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I have other question. Uh, uh -huh. One in the chat is a uh, different different uh, question. Uh -huh. uh, just now you mentioned that 
for older star, I assume the population uh, three stars, mm -hmm. uh, they do not leave uh, remnants, mm -hmm. such as black holes, uh, neutron stars. So that, that means, uh, how do you uh, answer a question like how galaxies form? Because the current model is that uh, black holes combine, uh, coalesce with one another and uh, become a supermassive black hole. So when, when you say that uh, old star does not leave any remnants, then how does it uh, affect our current model about uh, galaxy, uh, galaxy formation? Okay, so yeah, so for the old star, this is what we call as a first star. So first star is a produce after the Big Bang explosion. Right? So when we speak about the first star, it means that metallicity, Z, is zero. The one that I calculated here is have metallicity 0 0.002, around 2%. Which is the the second generation after that. So the third, uh, this uh, population tree or the first generation of star we call as first star, because of uh, it is uh, people thought it was um, very massive, it can go to one uh, I call it one million solar mass or something, something like that. Eh? Because of uh, what happened during that time, all the uh, molecular cloud being collapsed as a huge uh, hydrogen ball. So when we have this huge hydrogen ball and it will eventually die, it's also being uh, they call predicted uh, to die as this pan system supernova. There is no remnants. No remnants means that the remnants does not form, uh, for example, like neutron star, black holes. But there is what called a uh, nuclei or abundance has been uh, distributed. This is the one that gives the elements that form another generation of star. It means that uh, when it's uh, explode, there is a uh, carbon, neon, everything, and this one, at, when it reaches a certain point of the what they call universe, when there is a gravitational contraction there, it will pull all this element together and produce the second generation of star. So that is how it forms. Okay, uh, I, 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 I understand that, but mm -hmm. uh, my question is regarding how uh, galaxies form, how supermassive black holes form. I know it's... Uh, oh, okay. It's but yeah. when you say that the early star does not produce mm -hmm. any black holes, then how does it change our current understanding of uh, galaxy formation, supermassive yeah. black hole formation? Supermassive black hole formation and galaxy formation is totally two different things. Okay, so we, you have to uh, understand this is a different uh, way of uh, see. So when we see that, for example, supermassive uh, black hole, supermassive black hole coming from the uh, collection of so many black hole produced, and merge together. That is what happened at the Sagittarius uh, 87, right? So for example, um, although the first star, it, uh, what they call it, it produced uh, what they call it, no remnants, but we have to remember the each type of uh, what they call evolution of star, this, uh, when there is new star being produced, bit by bit, the, what they call it, uh, the matter element will be increased bit by bit. They increase by 1%, 2%, or so on. And at this part, there is probability of black hole being formed. Okay, so one thing of when the black hole will form, either is massive or non massive black hole. So when it comes together in one collective, uh, what they call it, uh, place, it starts to merge together due to the gravita gravitational contraction for all this black hole. And that's why it, it forms of the, what we call it, a supermassive black hole. But in galaxy uh, formation itself, it is a uh, totally different thing because this will include the understanding of how we understand the star formation, which is another big topic for to understand the star formation. Because when we study the star formation of the galaxy evolution, we have to consider what is the dust contribution, what is uh, the all this uh, elementary particle that contribute during that time. One thing that when we learn about astrophysics or galaxies, uh, this what they call it, uh, some galactic uh, formation, many things are still bulk, meaning that there are so many things that uh, people don't even, even know. They just assume that maybe at that particular time from the theoretical physics people predict, right? So this element will eventually uh, will form and produce what we understand what we are today. Okay, so sorry if I don't give you a very good answer, but that is what people done for the past few years. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, I saw your com your comrade professor uh, raise his hand. <laughs> Prof. Wait, wait, <laughs> <laughs> Prof. Hassan? Yeah. 
<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it was it was a long time ago. I have forgotten what I'm going to say. Uh, but uh, <laughs> remember, uh, uh, related to neutrino being uh, what with uh, moving with constant uh, velocity and so on. So well, the, the simple answer to that is that uh, neutrinos are relativistic particles, and relativistic particles would uh, the the velocity uh, are usually. Uh, 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 moving with a uh, speed of light. Yeah. Yeah, that is a simple, straightforward an answer to that. Uh, thank you. Both. I think that's what things. So, his comment. Uh, any other I, questions? So sorry if I missed some uh, chat or something like that. Yeah, uh, there are some questions from the chat if you want to answer. Oh, <laughs> Prof already answered certain things. Oh, I think I have an yeah. assistant to answer the question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was concentrating on answering the uh, chat. Yeah, just uh, maybe some of you might not surprise. It's actually my one of my PhD supervisor last time, and we are still in uh, within one theoretical group in UM. So yeah, so there is also my our student here, Sophia is here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Sophia is also the one so who has done a lot of calculation for this work. So, okay. Uh, any other any I other questions uh, apart from the ones in the chat, which I, I suppose has been answered? Anyone want to ask anything else? <laughs> well, uh, okay. the, the, <clears throat> I mean, in in no area that we've been talking about 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 dark matter. Dark, everything is dark. Dark matter, mm -hmm. dark holes. So, but in in medical, they have not. They don't call dark. They call gray. Gray matter. Oh, okay. You know what is gray matter? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> gray matter is our brain. <laughs> so oh, maybe there is a uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Go, go so on. Now, Brian. if if you have let's say dark, the 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 dark matters constitute is increasing. Over time, see, what will happen? I mean, I mean, the whole galaxy will be, we have a big uh, pool of uh, uh, dark, dark, dark holes, and everything will be pulled to the to the holes. It, it, so there is, uh, um, it is not safe to be near the hole. <laughs> I see. So the okay. hole keep on, keep on, keep on increasing. So what, what, what is the destiny of the universe? Okay, so uh, the question is, uh, there is two things different about the dark and black. Okay, <laughs> so one thing people uh, speak about the dark matter and also the black hole. So black hole, technically, people don't really know what is the what is the element itself. But for the dark matter, although they say that only like seventy percent is uh, mostly uh, it's a dark matter, but uh, it is uh, what they call it just a weakly interacting particle. And I don't think that they have some, um, if for example, like dark matter, they don't have really a strong, what they call it, gravitational force to make to make us fall into another, what they call it, uh, another dimension or something like that. So, but uh, in black hole, although people uh, study now, if uh, there is one color store today, even though it was located at the central of, uh, what they call mm -hmm. it, uh, the Sagittarius A, the center of the uh, galaxy, but is still that how it will pull for all those um, planet or any remnants near that is very far away. So I don't think that because we are in the Milky Way, which is at the arms of the Milky Way, we are still far away from that particular mm. <laughs> uh, black hole to for us to move to that direction. So I don't think we have to worry much about that. <laughs> okay, uh, I saw uh, uh, I saw another hand just now beside. Is that maybe we give him a chance? I'm okay. Uh, hi, doctor. Hi. I'm from University of Maya, second year student <laughs> physics. Okay, am I? Yes. Uh, this is such a dumb question, and I hope you could answer me. Uh, mm -hmm. So we all know that the sun is dying. Actually, this all of it is destined to be that right, to be dead, because, be dead. Uh, uh -huh. because they consume uh, hydrogen in that shell. Okay. So can we? Can we slow down the, the dying rate? Is it possible to do so if, if we somehow 
have an um, uh, infinite amount of hydrogen. Okay. Uh, yeah. You understand? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I get your, what, what you're trying to say. Okay. So technically, our sun uh, is uh, at the age of 4.6 billion years. And we are still burning hydrogen at this point. Okay. So uh, the sun will, uh, will finish burning hydrogen around 8 billion years. So we have another 4 billion years to go. So don't worry about that. We, we, you and me might not be alive during that time. So when people say that, uh, I don't know, maybe people see the, what they call it, uh, some uh, scientific, uh, what they, not scientific, but, um, some science fiction stuff or something like that, say that the sun is dying or something like that. Uh, it's not dying per se that it's going to, uh, what they call it, collapse or become dark eventually because as long as a photon being fused at the internal sun, so that's why we can still see the sunlight, right? the photon coming to us. So if, um, for example, you might read somewhere that sometimes you see that there is a dusk, I mean, the red dust or something, the, the, the sun become red or something, that is due to the dust, uh, what you call it, um, happen on our earth because of the reflection. So it does not, uh, nothing to do with the one that particularly the sun uh, is dying or not. It's totally different thing. So if the one that we are worrying, we all have to worry about what is uh, the fate of our earth that either is dying or not instead of we worry about our sun. Okay, uh, is that, you can continue. Okay, uh, my question is related to the question that I asked just now. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, so uh, when you say that black holes cannot be formed or you said something like uh, black holes are not formed or are not left up from the remnants of mm -hmm. the star so uh, that means uh, we have a time scale different from the formation of uh, say uh, supermassive black holes and what you observe today so for example we have observed uh, quasars that uh, age mm -hmm. old, as old as the universe itself mm -hmm. uh, so the question is since uh, we know that quasars are powered from supermassive black holes, and we have a model that uh, seems to predict that black holes are not formed from uh, early stars, so there's a time conflict with it, uh, between what we observe and what our model says. So doesn't that mean that we might have to uh, recheck about how we understand uh, black holes uh, form? Thank you. Okay, so yeah, I I can see that you're always curious about black hole, which is uh, totally um, what we call it uh, different things that we are discussing <laughs> from my world. Okay, so I understand that you're curious about the black hole, the quasar, or something like that. So when we uh, see that the formation of um, the universe itself coming from the start of the Big Bang, and where is this uh, the original black hole uh, coming from, and so on. So there is one thing that. Uh, people predict, yeah? so the current, I just give some current what, overview that people now is uh, detecting, for example, gravitational wave. Yeah? So gravitational wave is one way people also uh, observe, for example, black hole. So uh, one of the idea of uh, the detection of uh, the gravitational wave related to the black hole, people observe that in order to have certain uh, detection of black hole, there must be, there is a two very uh, massive star that uh, collide together and form this, uh, what we call it, uh, the gravitational wave. And people say that once the star is dying or eventually uh, explode or something like that, they should form another black hole that might be rotate each other and form another gravitational wave. But this uh, what we call understanding of physics, still people don't know what, uh, how this thing happened. Uh, for example, like if you see a quasar or supermassive black hole, uh, how does it form itself is it coming from, you have to remember there is million of star produced in our universe itself. So if in our galaxy, we, in our what we call Milky Way itself, we have million of star. So in our Milky Way, we uh, the what we call the metricity is around uh, solar metricity. This is what we see, and we have million of star. So this million of star might be somewhere that is uh, producing black hole somewhere. And this black hole will, um, when we form, quite uh, what they call it uh, a lot and we'll start to if it's close enough it will uh, what they call it interact each other and form more and more black hole this is also happened for example the one that i did this one is uh, 
the neighboring gal galaxy. This is uh, what I did is SMC, a small magnetic cloud and also large magnetic cloud. I didn't explain in the slide, but this is the idea. At this particular galaxy itself, also there is a million of uh, the star. So a million of star at the same time, probably there is, we, we don't know what is the probability of the star already dying or already explode as a, or it live as a remnant of black hole. So, but if you say that for the first star, the first star is occur many, many billion years ago. So when we say at the first point, obviously there is no black hole, but we have to see what is the time frame of the evolution of the universe itself. From there, obviously there is some process that maybe the black hole is formed. And uh, in that process, when it's uh, what they call it, have more and more in that hole, they will merge together to form this massive black hole. So for example, I don't study quasar, as I have no idea how the quasar, uh, what they call behave. So from here, we can see that when we study and people observe, for example, jet or uh, that, <coughs> what they call it, illuminated by the black hole, for example, these are people are trying to understand, does it coming from our own universe, which is our Milky Way, or our different universe. So there is a, not a different, what they call it, type of stages should be take consideration because uh, the one we study here is not overall. It's very specific for certain, what they call it, localized universe that you want to study. Okay. Yeah, you have to, uh, limit, need, yeah. Okay. You need to limit the, I saw three hands. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's for, for 15, uh, <laughs> Perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll give it, I give the opportunity to Dr. Zaidan who has not yet asked any questions. Okay. Uh, Dr. Zaidan, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Okay. Please. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Chamudin, and thank you, uh, Dr. Nohaliza. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, you mentioned uh, the star Betelgeuse uh -huh. just now. Uh -huh. Betelgeuse. And, uh, I know that the star has become a celebrity recently. Yes, correct. Okay. And uh, there was a hype on the on the star uh, was think uh, was thought to to exhibit uh, some kind of supernova explosion or at least in in our lifetime uh. yes correct uh, and it turns out to be just um, a fake news of sort uh, because of the presence of dust uh, yes. in front of our uh, line of sight so correct. how does it relate to the study of neutrinos uh, mm -hmm. If there is any study on on uh, neutrinos on dead stars mm -hmm. that can debunk debunk this news about the dimming of Betelgeuse because it is about to explode as a supernova. Okay, so is there any data or uh, any argument from the study of neutrinos of that star uh, actually, that can debunk that news uh, yeah. in the first place? Thank you. Oh, okay, so thank you, Dr. Zaiden. So when we speak about Betelgeuse, which is uh, people uh, being very, what, there is even a Twitter account dedicated of, to measure what is the <laughs> luminosity of the Betelgeuse today, tomorrow, and so on. People do some a very massive measurement for Betelgeuse because uh, people thought it going to uh, die soon or explode soon. One thing of uh, the work that uh, we have done here can be, can be put as a constraint to know whether Betelgeuse is exploding or not is by we have to know what is the progenitor mass of the bitter juice progenitor mass means that the mass at birth for the bitter juice okay mm -hmm. so that is one thing that we have to know so if we know where is the mass of bit, uh, the initial mass of the bitter juice we can put this um, the luminosity track into the mapping of the hr diagram the hr mm -hmm. diagram that i uh, i put it here okay so here we can uh, put this is all this uh, observation of the a lot of star people observe so maybe bitter juice is somewhere here so when we uh, check that uh, at this particular uh, bitter juice what is the temperature what is the so this is can be observed eh, through the uh, optical telescope so when we observe this um, uh, luminosity and temperature we can see that at what point the bitter juice is located and obviously bitter juice is already i think at the rate supergiant eh? So red supergiant is somewhere here. So when it's red supergiant, is the size is larger. So from there we have to study what is the track. That is the reason we uh, we study the HI diagram. We have to study what is the track of the evolution of the star. Okay, mm -hmm. and then we can predict what is the what called the progenitor. So from the progenitor, we can estimate at certain stage what is the neutrino flux being produced at that particular uh, stage of 
uh, what we call it bitter juice. And since we know the temperature and also, and we can estimate density from there, we can, we should know what is the neutrino flux produced by the bitter juice and it can make a constraint. But the problem is now when we want to do this observation, the sensitivity of the neutrino detector currently cannot be detected uh, as far as BT juice. Yeah. That is the problem now because people are still building the detector get sensitive towards that direction. Okay, so mm -hmm. although uh, a lot of um, what do you call it, people try to improve for the detector, but it will take some time uh, for the experimenters to uh, to really measure the sensitivity that it can calculate the flux of that particular star, uh, sun, uh, particular star for, for example, that beta juice. So that's why and in nowadays, people are start to recalculate back again, a new, uh, what they call neutrino flux for supernova, for very much star. This is to give some constraint to the newly built hyper uh, super kamikande that coming soon. So it will, once this, uh, what they call it, being, uh, being finished, uh, built, and we can see that how is it we can overlap observation and also our theoretical prediction for this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is my answer for your question. Right, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, I think I need to you know, limit the questions now. There are two raised hands uh, previously. Uh, <laughs> we don't <laughs> yet. No, uh, we need to stop the recording. <laughs> yes, okay, yeah, yeah, oh, it's already one hour, okay. Uh, Pro Hassan, uh, you have uh, anything to say or question just now? You raise your hand. Oh, um, I removed my hand already. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so you don't want to say anything. Uh, uh, no, 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 I, I'm no. going to reserve one last question for my own self. <laughs> yeah. I uh, Ayman, one brief question, please. Are you still there? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm still here. Uh, so this is just another dumb question. Uh, this had been debated, I guess, for decades for now. The question is, which comes first, either the black hole or the stars? And I want to know what is your opinion on this? Black hole or the stars? Or the star will Sorry, come the, first? Sorry, the, black, the black holes or the galaxy? The black hole or the galaxy? Okay, so in my opinion, the galaxy will come first due to the, uh, what they call it, dust formation in our early universe. That is my opinion. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, guess, I guess we we need to stop. But before we stop, I have one last question. Okay, I, I, I'm I'm pretty amazed by the number of curves and you know, that you produce. Uh, now I believe most of these are theoretical and not not and not some from from uh, observational kind of thing, right? Yes, correct. We are yeah, theoretical. So, so there are uh, I suppose there will be some equations and computational work. Being Correct. There. So, can you briefly, you know, uh, uh, for us beginners and also interested students, you mm -hmm. know, can you briefly tell how much work is, you know, has gone through to produce all these curves? You know, what kind of equations been done and things like that? Okay. So, uh, first of all, yes. okay, thank you, Mr. Mudin. Um, because I don't put any equation here because I don't want to make people okay. uh, scared. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at this, a lot of massive, uh, uh, what they call it, plots and everything we have discussed here. So first of all, uh, we have to, well, most of people know we have to have a basic understanding in physics, right? So the undergraduate, uh, what they call it, level that we have learned in our university is the basis of everything. So from there, uh, when we start to study, because my study is a combination of what they call it, uh, theoretical physics, I mean, astrophysics and also particle physics. Yeah? So actually it's more like low energy nuclear physics actually because of the neutrino itself. So one thing that uh, we have to start off is you have to understand how the stellar evolution equation, the diffusion equation that uh, being, what they call it, uh, being built and how it can be implemented in the computational. Because why? Uh, when we want to build a star, we cannot uh, calculate by hand. Maybe a long time ago, Chandra Sekar do it by hand or Kai Pahang doing by hand. But when uh, it can be only done by hand if you calculate, for example, for, for sun, for example. But when you want to deal with the more complicated physics in massive star, we need some computational work because this has to be run uh, simultaneously. Okay, so it means that we have to run four different equations 
that govern the stellar evolution uh, plus with time this time due to the nuclear reaction okay so you need also the understanding of how the equation of nu uh, nuclear reaction is being uh, put in the stellar evolution and then we can evolve from the zam zam is a zero h main sequence star until whatever stage that we want and this requires a very heavy computing uh, what do you call it a uh, time and it cannot be run in your computer it will crash eventually but if you run for low master it's okay but for my work i require a very high performance uh, computing facility uh, to calculate all this thing and it will take like few uh, weeks for one models and it will generate millions of data for part one particular models okay so that is the astrophysics part so for the uh, neutrino part uh, obviously when i was a student i have to study particle physics uh, i studied with professor obviously because he is um, our lecturer last time so uh, we have to study a bit of um, the what they call it the background of quantum mechanics and also either uh, either our, because this uh, uh, star itself we consider is non-relativistic and then we have to implement the neutrino or the uh, this elementary particle in a relativistic form so this is things that we have to understand what is the limit what is the difference between this thing and obviously we have to see that when we have set of equation although i don't derive all the salam weinberg equation for the neutrino or what they call it uh, calculation but you have to understand where to uh, where, how to fit into the astrophysics part so you have to understand the equation the physics and how we want to implement numerically in uh, in the what they call it in the stellar evolution so the idea is when you want to calculate all these things, you will require uh, a bit of um, what they call it reading and also a bit uh, and calculation because before we want to transform in the code, we have to really understand the equation itself. If not, it's just like we we just see all this nice curve but have no idea how it can be transformed or the physics behind it. So there is a bit of uh, what they call it things because of the neutrino part. Also, we have done quite uh, what they call it long time to uh, to check, to re-derive, uh, to make sure that it will uh, complement with uh, the current understanding in the literature. So that is, uh, I can say that all this work it takes right more than five years. <laughs> I can say that uh, people might be afraid that say it's very long time, but this is how the uh, what they call it fundamental knowledge work, right? So. We can uh, we cannot produce this some very well uh, result because uh, people might not happy especially because this kind of field is being pioneered or being dominated by people from the west. Eh? So when we want to convince them that our work is very good, so you have to make sure that everything uh, should be put in place and it should be what called acceptable with the current understanding, uh, the physics understanding. So that's my answer for that. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Dr. Nahas and Lisa. I hope uh, that attracts people rather than... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is another book. <laughs> okay, I, I think was, this was a, an interesting talk. It went even uh, past half past four. So I think uh, it's a, a very successful uh, talk. So I think we we'll like to thank you, uh, Dr. Nahas and Lisa, and also your, your students and professor. And, <laughs> Oh yeah, okay. my. Just come to the, the talk today. So thank you, very, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I think we should stop now. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you.